to record a podcast using Zoom. So that's what Ted really, Brinley said. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, I heard you talking to him this weekend. I said we got to have her on because um, okay. you're right. Yeah, Katie. Words. Didn't we talk, Katie, about a few months ago? I think we did. We did. We did. Because when when Bruce gave me your name, I said, "Oh, we've talked in the past. Uh, you know, a few months yeah. back." When well, we did the the database, the four hundred. Yeah enslaved individuals at Evergreen, yes. Oh, cool. Uh, at least cool to have a database. Um, well, sure, yes. So let's go ahead and start. I think I've got us recording. Yes, so I'm Bruce McGee. And I'm Steve Payne. And we're here today with uh, Katie Shannon. And did you, did you say that Morris? How you see Morlos. Her? Morlos, okay. Katie Morlos Shannon. And, um, You've written a book, and we'll get to that in a minute, but tell us the name of the book and where people can find it. It's called The New Orleans Bee, Dispatches from the First Year of Louisiana's Longest-Running French Language Newspaper, and it's available on Amazon.com and Kindle Books. Good. And um, can you hold it up for us, or is it... Um, okay. Oh, wow. Yeah, there you go. Turn it a little bit. It's we got a glare. There we go. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And <laughs> come out with a paper copy, or is it? Um, what's I'm, your status on that? I'm thinking about it. I um, I'm, I've I've got a lot on my plate right now. Um, right. I'm working on another book that will release next year with with Pelican Publishing uh, called Antoine of O'Galley about the enslaved gardener at O'Galley. Oh, cool. So, but but yeah, I I am thinking about doing that. I'm gonna look into and that. Um, this is in English, right? It's, it's a yes. translation into English from right. the original French. Okay, so uh, if, like me, you're rather backward at French or have none whatsoever, which is closer, then this is your window into New Orleans of a hundred, almost 200 years right. ago. Right, right. Wow, Very close just, to it. I just did the math. <laughs> Why it's not a hundred? No, no, it's almost two hundred years ago. Yeah. I know. So, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, I am um, like an eighth or ninth generation Louisiana, and I've lost count. There's been so many. My family first arrived here in 1718 when New Orleans. Um, was established. My mom's side of the family is from Southwest Louisiana, and my dad's from the city and the river parishes. So I kind of, I kind of cover most of the state. Y'all cover the rest, right? No, we the cover other the part. North part. Uh, yeah. That's yeah. right. Um, I grew up in Mandeville. Went uh, to LSU for my bachelor's and master's degree in history. Um, spent a decade in the city. And, um, and back in Mandeville again, raising my three little kids. But I've been a professional historian for about 15 years. I started at Whitney Plantation doing the early research there and then moved on to Laura Plantation where I helped um, San Marmion curate and research and design um, an exhibit about the enslaved community there. And now I am the head of history <coughs> and education oh, at Evergreen. Plantation. In fact, we have a rotating series of backgrounds, and I picked the one today in your honor. Um, yes. Tell our folks yes. who that is, uh, besides me and Steve. My friend Norman Marmion, um, who, uh, whom I've known for a very long time now, since graduate school. Yes, we, we uh, went to New Orleans in um, 2013. And on our way in, we had scheduled the afternoon with Norm. And we sat on the back porch, and Sam took the picture and brought us drinks. And uh, oh, he told us the story about bringing back Laura Plantation, which is just an insane. You should listen to the episode if our listeners haven't. Yeah, that's the image behind you. Right, right. I, uh, I uh, <laughs> dug it up for today, and uh, that's Norm and us actually on the porch and uh, uh, talking, because every week we say, come up on the porch, we're just talking about Love it. We're hardly ever on a porch, but we were that right. day. Metaphorical. A virtual porch. That's metaphorical it. porch, yes. Metaphorical and metaphysical, but that day we were on a, a, a physical embodiment of the porch, and it was so hot. <laughs> it usually is out there. <laughs> but the next day, an early cold front came in. This was the end of August, and the rest of the week was lovely. 
uh, in New Orleans. Um, okay. we, we had set up several interviews. We had uh, been on the anthology project for a year, and this was about three months into the uh, into the um, into the uh, podcast. Podcast, right? Yes. Right. So the Whitney and the Laura Plantation are just right by each other, but they could they be more different in their scholarly uh, uh, subject matter. So tell, why don't you tell us a bit about, and I guess you know Ibrahim Asek. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, I, I worked with him. And then Evergreen, too. Ever, Evergreen Plantation is right there as well. So we're all kind of clustered together. Um, well, but, tell us the three focuses of the different, you know, well, research that you've been doing at the three plantations. Whitney Plantation's primary focus is about the enslaved. And that's a very important thing. I mean, to have a plantation dedicated to the viewpoint of an enslaved person that that's huge and necessary and they're doing good work there now it is more of a broad overview of slavery as in slavery in america versus a very site specific creole uh what exactly happened on the whitney plantation with the heidels and and uh, approach so it's it's more going for a broader scope of telling the story of slavery in in our country. Um, Laura is very site specific. You're hearing stories about the people who lived on site, uh, thanks in large part to the diaries left by Laura LaCool Gore, who was born there and lived there. And we uh, amassed hundreds of pages of firsthand accounts from different people in different eras, both um, free and enslaved, of every race and background who lived at Laura. <coughs> so the story you're getting is about people who actually lived there. And we believed at, in telling the story of the individual, you're going to learn about the broader narrative. And the thing about um, Laura Plantation, I know because we talked to Norm about it, their research went back to pre-internet. And he just told us about making phone call after phone call. To research. Yes possible relatives and just looking around random phone books all over the country that last names and calling them up cold call did you mm -hmm. know this you know are you from this branch of the family do you have any records he finally tracked down somebody that kind of had the rosetta stone or all those family records yeah. what did you get or do you get anything from any travelers that were passing through and left diaries and, and getting like an outsider's perspective oh. on the, the plantation. Well, the, the, we have not found one that um, specifically, a, a diary that specifically mentions Laura, but we've found um, like um, notarial records, legal records, um, pension file records, uh, things like that, that um, talk about people who lived there, what went on there during the Civil War, um, that kind of thing. Now in Evergreen Plantation, Jane Body has been working on that for 20 years, and that is a big focus on community, the German coast area, which um, if you think about how far back those first settlers came like in the in the very very early 1700s and they've been there since then so evergreen's plantation evergreen plantations history spans the french spanish and colonial eras all the way up to today and then many of the people who lived and worked on the plantation still reside in the neighboring community of edgard and lucy and um so it's all very immediate to them and very, um, it resonates with them and it's about telling their stories as well. And that's what we were trying to do with the, the database of the enslaved. Uh, and um, we might point out that the thing that Laura is best known for are the wonderful folk tales from Africa that Alcee Forche uh, collected closer to a hundred years ago. Why don't you tell our folks a little bit about that? So Alcee Fortier was um, born in, down the road on Valker M plantation, which is now no, no longer standing. That was his grandfather's plantation. And Valker M was like one of the richest, wealthiest, most well-known Creole plantation owners you could find. And he then went on um, 
to uh, build homes for all his children. And they, they, were, they had a huge plantation, um, almost like a monopoly throughout that area. So Alce grew up there and then recognized that the stories that we were being told by those um, who were previously enslaved were of value. He was a folklore professor, a professor of languages at Tulane University, and he went back in the slave cabins and um, collected, started collecting their stories, which came from the first enslaved people brought to Louisiana from the Senegal area of Africa. Um, and they were about Compère Bouki and Compère La Pen, um, friends. Is, um, my high screen school school working? Hmm? Is my screen share working? Can you yeah, see it? Yeah, uh, I see it. It's, um, it's an Alcée Fortier story, Petit Bonhomme Gaudron. Um, but he wrote them down in Corivini, which is the kind of Creole French dialect or patois that the um, enslaved spoke. And he, he interviewed quite a few different people. Um, only some of them did he actually acknowledge the name of the people, <laughs> but he at least recognized the value in the stories. So he wrote them all down. And um, Norman knew that those stories had originated in Vachery or, or could be traced to Vachery. And so that was his big draw to Bloor Plantation was knowing that there was a connection with those stories and, and getting um, the plantation and, and telling about them. Now, the, the great thing is, it's not even just um, original to Laura or original to Valker yeah. M's. It goes up and down the river. It's throughout French Louisiana because the enslaved population coming from Senegal, they settled all up and down the river on plantations. So these are really Louisiana stories. They were transformed. They, they came from Senegal, but were transformed um, by Louisiana French and then became their own unique kind of Creole stories. And of course, this is the famous Tar Baby story. We more better in the country know, even in Louisiana, probably better know the uh, Uncle Remus, Br'er Rabbit, Br'er Fox, all that. But, and, and probably partly that is due to the fact that I'll see if you look at his, uh, what he's doing with uh, all these footnotes. This yes. showed up in like, I think it was an early edition of the PMLA, Publication of the Modern Language Association. Mm -hmm. Professor French, he was a, a president of the PMLA. He helped set it up. Right. You know, modern, you know, uh, any kind of uh, language plus English department. You know, they all want to publish. Well, and he's, he's also, we could give him credit. He's not doing full-on narratology, but it's like proto-narratology and study mm -hmm. narrative. He's, he's kind of laying the groundwork that comes along later with people like Milman Perry in the 20th century. Like, you know, like, say, in the 20s and 30s when he starts figuring out how the Odyssey and the Iliad were composed. Mm -hmm. So he's kind of he's kind of prefiguring Milman Perry, in a, in, you know, a little bit. And they're collecting these folklore tales, and... But unfortunately, for most of history, they've sat on a shelf in research libraries, you know, college <clears throat> universities. Right. And I think Norm and Sand have done a lot to dust those stories off. You can go to a bookstore right off that porch mm -hmm. and buy that book. You know, they published yes. it as a separate pamphlet and a lot of other Brea Rabbit, you know, Tar Baby type stories. Have you talked right. to Brian Wagner by any chance? Um, who? Brian Wagner. Oh no, I don't, I'm not familiar. He wrote the book on the tar baby recently. And he talked about its function in oh. Africa versus yes. its function in the new and, world. And it was a trickster tale and it kind of mm -hmm. empowered the enslaved. And it was yes. um, told <clears throat> by the ancestors, you know, the older generation, the griots, the storytellers, to kind of instruct them the children on how to navigate this world yes. in which they were seen as pawns almost, or as having no autonomy. And in this way, they could learn ways around the master and kind of trick the master or be more clever right. and find a way to have a degree of empowerment. And they function, they function a little bit like the bards and the, the old um, priestly class, like yeah. in, in the ancient Near East and also in ancient Eastern Europe. Yeah. And I can, he said that in Africa, most of these stories end with Compare Le Pen getting killed. 
because he's committing a crime against the community. He wants the community well, we all share for it, we all work for it, but he wants to freeload off of it. Like mm -hmm. in America though, suddenly Le Pen is getting away with it for precisely the reason to say, because you can't use force, you can't simply run off. What can you do? You can use trickery and you have to be clever. Uh, like at a critical point in um, oh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. The posse is hunting <coughs> Liza when she's run away. They stop uh, uh, on the road and ask a black man, old black man who's uh, working there, which way did she go? You tell her of the forks, you tell them the truth, and you tell them a lie. And he told them uh -huh. the truth. They disbelieved him and went down the wrong road. And then they got mad at him and said, but I told you the truth. So that's what you're talking about is a trickster because that's what they had as a tool. Suddenly it, right. you know, the, the boss is stealing all your labor. And in the story, in the version uh, we, I just showed you, uh, Carol Pinned up on a dig in the well because he thinks that after he digs it, the, the lion will just take ownership of it and charge him to use it anyway. Because mm -hmm. uh, Sounds like a master to me, right? But otherwise, right. it's very close in some ways to the African original. So they preserved the core of this story. It's like Lion King. You've got Macaque, the, 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 um, he's the uh, medicine man. You know, uh -huh. you've got uh, the lion is the king. You've got other characters like Buki. Yeah, what's a Buki? Nobody knew, but it's a hyena. Right? It's, ever from Africa. it's amazing how you can preserve from generation to generation for a hundred years this knowledge. And that was one of the only things they had. I mean, that was theirs. They weren't allowed much, but they possessed those. And that was, they were very meaningful to them. And one difference. That's the way, that's the way that cultures like that wind up perpetuating themselves. You know, they, yes. they go from generation to generation that we, you know, we're getting into some really deep stuff here with oral narratives and right. cultures that are pre-literate or, or proto-literate or literate, any of the three, the, the, one of the main ways, not the only way, but one of the main ways they preserve their heritage and their culture is through the story, as well as through music and dance and that kind of, you know, their food ways, et cetera. Well, and South Louisiana is almost unique in the continental United States in allowing the slaves to preserve their culture. Part of the master class being able to rule was through social death. They would bring in people from different places, mm -hmm. they would mix them up, break up families, keep people right. from organizing, kind of like they do now. Um, yeah. But um, in Louisiana, most people were from Senegal and Gambia and they kept these, they had the, the Congo Square in New Orleans where you could dance, practice your <coughs> native religion. The, um, yeah, Gwendolyn Midlow Hall talks about that, how yeah. the original group that came in in 1719 and, you know, the first um, groups of, of Africans that were brought in were from basically the same place and shared the same culture. Then there were, there was a time period of several decades in which no new slave imports were brought in. And so that culture was allowed to thrive because mm -hmm. they, you know, the white European settlers needed them. And they were, were willing to do a, something to make them happy. And plus, I mean, you couldn't keep them back. They were all one, you know, and they needed to help to work the land. So they maintained that cultural heritage. And then it went with the Spanish era, there was an influx of Africans again, and it was this re-Africanization. And what wound up happening was the population became more heavily black and, than white. So then you have this, this um, population that is so large, you really can't fully control it. But in Louisiana is such miserable terrain at the period for Europeans yeah. to live because of the f yellow fever. It had a lot of absentee. And then you wound up with creoles of color actually owning plantations themselves. And, you know, if you could survive the yellow fever and the other tropical diseases. It's the, yeah, it's the latitude. That's the issue because the further south, the, further, the closer you are to the equator, those diseases like that will thrive. Right. Right. And yellow fever, tropical. anything else. I mean, what's that? It's, sub, it's a subtropical environment. Exactly. And then, it, it's kind of a catch-22 because the subtropical environment is what allows you to grow the sugar cane, which mm -hmm. 
they are making massive profits off of, and yet at the same time, their crops are always threatened because we, we do get frosts. So And hurricanes. Yes. You know, a hurricane can wipe out a sugar crop if, if it's badly timed. Well, and that brings us to your book, kind of tied together there, because uh -huh. your book has to do a lot with the sugar plantation and the need to start bringing in more slaves, this time through internal sales. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your book? What was La Bella um, and, um, you know, how you got interested in publishing excerpts from that for modern readers? So um, La Bella is the French for the bee, and it was not the first French language newspaper in New Orleans, but it was the longest running. And it was begun by Francois Delope in um, 1827 and ran up until about 1923. And it, it follows the kind of demise of the Creole language and the Francophone culture, uh, which is why it, it, it died out. But it was the longest running. It was kind of the grand dame of, of newspapers. And at its time, at its height, it was really, really, um, well known both by French speakers and English speakers. But then after the Civil War, uh, things became more Americanized, business was done in English. And um, the French, while they continued to read the newspaper, wanted their children to be able to speak English. Plus it became almost um, a stigma if you couldn't speak English. Well, and there was an organized attack on French by the Anglos especially the legislature, I believe you said in an interview with Ed, stopped publishing official government notices in French right. as a way of trying to suppress the elder language. In 1914, they outlawed um, French being used in um, government documents. French would no longer be used in legal documents, so the La Bea, the, the B, was continuing to make its money off of contracting with the government to print those French legal documents. And now they lost that revenue, that source of income. From the time of the Louisiana Purchase up until 1914, any legal transaction or, or legal case had to be published in both French and English in order to be accessible to everyone. But this was kind of reflecting that time period by 1910, St. Louis Cathedral had stopped saying a French mass. They were not recording sacramental records in French anymore. So there was a movement across South Louisiana towards English. Right. And I have another screen share for you. Ah. Yes, a few years ago, I decided there should be a La Bella. <laughs> up a new French language uh, oh. <laughs> and nothing much has come of it yet but I'm hoping it's like field of dreams if you build it they will come sure so we got the first story published oh, great about the demise of Hubig's pies <laughs> Which would be very much in keeping with the kind of news that they published because um, they did shipping news. They did. They were very obsessed with what was going on in Europe, but then there were also these marvelous um, little slices of life of what was going on in the 1820s in, um, in New Orleans, like the circus coming to town or the Catholic Church having a lottery. Or It was just really fun Dickensian kind of things. Right. So did Houdini, how, did Houdini ever play New Orleans, the magician? Do you know? Because I'm wondering if they would have announced that. I'm not sure. Not, I don't believe, well, I, I only, my book only covers from um, 1827 to 1828, the first year. Oh, okay. So, yeah, yeah so, so he doesn't die till 1926, but I have, right. his, I own a copy of his last interview. And it was written by a guy whose mysteries I collect and had the chance to meet and didn't. But I know that the, the guy that wrote that, well, he wrote, this guy wrote the Shadow Magazine. He was the lead writer, but he came to New Orleans an awful lot. And I suspect Houdini did at some point because he was the big, you know, magician slash escapologist or escape artist of that time. So I figure he would have played New Orleans at some point. Everybody comes to New Orleans. <laughs> yeah, I mean... So tell us how you got interested in La Bella. Well, um, 
it was, it's actually funny because it was during another crisis. So right now we're experiencing the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. And I, it, it, for whatever reason, I started to think about, you know, things, I, I'm on a brief hiatus from my, my, my job currently. Um, that's how I like to, to put it. You Have know, they reopened of, yet? I guess uh, yeah, usually we've been yeah. starting our interviews with check-ins. So how are you doing in the COVID era? Well, our, our, the tourism industry has been hit tremendously. Man, right. And um, there are, there's not, there, we don't really have a lot of answers. And um, I, we tend to think that um, Evergreen will have more of an educational bent in the future. But, um, you know, it's waiting to see day by day how this all progresses. So um, I started to think about what I had um, in my own collection that might be of use or of interest to someone during this time where some people have a little more time to read. And I recalled that um, right after Hurricane Katrina, I had gone down to the HNOC, the Historic New Orleans Collection, and gone through the microfilms of the entire first year of um, the B and wrote down anything that I thought, well, it was anything that per was pertaining to slavery or free people of color, but also um, anything that I just found interesting or quirky or just really quintessentially New Orleans. Um, and I, I had that for years and years and said, well, it's just sitting on my computer, so I should put it to some good use. Um, so it was kind of one crisis inspiring <laughs> another crisis, sort of. And uh, as somebody who has spent time at the Jefferson Parish Library uh, website pouring mm -hmm. over the old copies of Lafayette, it is a wretched scan. So oh, okay. um, are there any paper copies anywhere extant? Like does Tulane have them in their basement or, uh, you know, what, what have you found? Like, you know, to go, but like Joseph Macos has done with the, uh, the, uh, with the uh, Times Picky, and you know, he's got mm -hmm. those, tens of thousands of copies of old Picayunes. So is there that somewhere for La Bella or is the, the you know, uh, microfilm the best we'll ever have? But I think the microfilm is the most accessible. I'm not, I would, I would imagine there have to be some extant copies. I'm not aware of where they're located, but um, microfilm has been the only way that I've accessed them. Now, certain online news, um, search engines like newspaper.com and genealogybank.com have digitized some of the records, um, but it's still, it's, it's not a lot of them. Um, it's only a few. And I think that like what you're getting to at is that the French language has kind of held this whole thing back. Um, people right. don't really find it accessible both because of the poor condition of the microfilm, but also because they, they don't know the language. And though right. there was a time in which they were printing both an English version and a French mm -hmm. version in the same paper. Right. Um, so um, after Katrina, not much to do. So you can get to the micro, were these like the old school yeah. microfilms? It's what an internet. Uh, no, these were crank, 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 crank. Um, mm -hmm. Under a glaring light. <laughs> yes, which, oh my gosh, kids these days, they don't know how good they have it. And then you go into the New Orleans Public Library now and you push a button and it like electronically zooms. And then you can put your, your jump drive in and scan it and email it to yourself or save it on there. I used to have to go in with rolls of quarters that I would get from Whitney oh, Bay. Oh, yeah. do this. <laughs> totally. I have spent so much money on microfilm copies. And right. Again, they're pretty wretched copies, and you've got to, you know, I guess if you do it all day, every day, you get pretty good at it, but I was always making the copy wrong, so then I'd have to spend some, some more money making another copy. Um, right. Uh, and, yeah, so um, what did you find from that first year? Like, what were they writing about? And we, that brings us back to the influx of slaves all of a sudden. That, right. Um, so there had been a ban on the importation of slaves in the mid-1820s. There was some concern about um, slaves coming in from both Haiti, where there had been um, a an, an successful slave uprising, and up in Virginia, where they, they, people were just, um, they were not trustful they, of um, outside slaves. They thought that they might cause um, the revolt caused them to um, 
kind of incite things amongst mean, the Creole slave population. You mean outside agitators? Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Our slaves um, are happy, don't you see? Right, Emma? we're all, yes, all the Creole slaves were perfectly happy until these other people came in and gave them ideas. Oh Please know I'm sarcastic here. Yeah, yeah these um, meetings are so old. If you grew up in my era, I'm much older than you, but I remember the end of Jim Crow segregation and people saying that exact thing that our black if they right. said blacks but our blacks are happy it's those outside agitators it's that martin luther king coming in yeah. and getting them out and he doesn't riot but they sure do riot after he's been here and oh my goodness mm -hmm. uh, well or they they the outgrowth of that when i came along after you but before katie and there's a there was a really famous or infamous uh lynching here in lincoln parish and it was in the I think around 1939 or 40 or sometime, it was right before we got involved in World War II. Mm -hmm. And some uh, uh, journalists here, right here in Ruston now, and this is still pretty infamous, but he had the records and a lot of eyewitness testimony of people that participated. And I heard people saying when I was in high school, quote, oh, we don't need to bring that up. Right. Uh, we need to let sleeping dogs lie. And this is, this is, you know, 45, 50 years after the fact, you know, well, I'm in, and, in college. Right. Uh, it was in, in history, it's it's like Faulknerian, you know. It, it's the past is never past. Right. I went. I yeah, would yeah, go yeah. to a rural courthouse and go to look up historical records, and I I asked, where are the court records? Um, because from the the antebellum era. And, oh, honey, you seem like such a sweet girl. Why do you want to go digging up all that bad stuff? You don't want to know about all that. So. <laughs> Oh my God. Kind of under, underestimated me a little bit. Um, yeah. But, I would but, have been I mean, seething off, you know, just really just seething by that time. <laughs> see, I'm not allowed to do that. I have to, I have to, because they, I have to have access to my records. Right. So, so you have to be polite in right. Southern. That's right. That's right. But the, they finally. Just tell them you're it. doing family genealogy and they'll let yeah. you write in. That, that they would enjoy that much more. You're right. But they, they lifted the ban on imports of slaves. This is all through the domestic slave trade. Oh, and the by the United way, before we, before we leave uh -huh. what you just were talking about, because the Whitney, the focus, one of the focus is the German coast uprising, yes. which embodied all the, um, the paranoia of the Southern uh, slave owners. So just, before we get back to the other thing, uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's so funny you bring that up because I literally was writing about that in chapter five of my Antoine of Oak Alley book, um, talking about uh, today, talking about how it must have been to be a young enslaved boy growing up in an era in which things like this occurred. So, and that was part of why there was a ban. Um, in 1811, uh, uh, the enslaved population at Michel Andre's plantation in St. Charles Parish on the east bank of the river near what is today Laplace rose up, um, attacked him, and killed his son. He fled across the river to the west bank and led by Charles Deland, um, they began to make their way downriver to New Orleans. It was became, became almost as much as 500 enslaved people. They were gathering more support as they moved from plantation to plantation, armed with anything from hoes and cane knives to actual guns. And this was very organized. They marched like an army. They fought almost like an army. And it was systematic and it was rapid and it was a true threat. And New or they got word of that in New Orleans and Governor Claiborne got together a militia and called out the regular army as well, um, and then a, um, a group of troops were sent down from Baton Rouge, and then on the West Bank in the River Parishes, uh, Andre uh, organized a militia. So they were coming at them from three different directions, and they encountered them at uh, Jacques Fortier's plantation where they had stopped to spend the night um, around where Kenner is today, and it was just, it was a massacre. They they were so many killed. I, I don't think that, that we'll ever know the exact number, but they were mowed down. It was an execution. Um, the leader was just 
brutally murdered and mutilated. And then after all of that, there was a tribunal organized to, you know, supposedly render justice in this situation. But it was, the tribunal consisted of plantation owners whose plantations had been threatened in that very area. So they're being tried by the very people that they rose up against. And um, they were mostly um, executed. And then their heads were ordered to be impaled on pikes and lined the river for 30 miles from Andre's um, plantation all the way to New Orleans as a, as a warning to right. the enslaved population in the area. It's, it's old medieval. Has, That's an old medieval yeah. form of execution. But you, know, also, you, you get rid of the you get rid of the the ringleaders and their followers, but then you make an object case or an object lesson yeah. out of them by putting the heads on pikes or on stakes or something, so that this is a warning to everybody else that follows. Right. And it reminds me of Heart of Darkness, the idea of uh, the savagery <laughs> of European culture um, when it's projecting its you know, and mm -hmm. perceives itself on either projecting its power or perceiving its power under threat. Right. Um, which is kind of, you know, an explanation of the whole Trump presidency, uh, you know, the, the reaction to the black guy in the White House. And, uh, yes. Um, you know, we're going to just go crazy, you know, and you see these guys in Walmart with RPGs, you know, if, in case the... Uh, uh, I don't know, the yogurt starts acting up, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, there was there was a panic and a furor that um, characterized that era and that led to people, well, well at that time they blamed imports, imports and I say imports, I'm, we're talking about human beings. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't diminish that. But people, enslaved people that were brought in from the Caribbean, particularly right. Haiti, they brought in those Haitian, uh, you know, yeah. uh, ideas. Because um, they found, they did find them with some of the literature of the paraphernalia uh, of the French rights of man hidden in the slave cabins. And there were yeah. some chanting uh, that that were um, associated with, with the revolution. But it was, when investigated, and, and people always said, oh, Charles Delon is, was from Haiti, or he was a free man of when investigating, he was not. He was neither of those things. He was a Creole slave. And um, so they decided to limit um, slave importation. And um, now you couldn't, you were technically not supposed to bring anyone in from Africa. That ended in 1808. But the domestic right. slave trade from Virginia and North and South Carolina was huge because they had an excess population. We mm -hmm. down here had so much disease and hardship that right. we could barely keep um, a steady population growth. Amongst Being people. sold south was a byword among slaves yeah. through the rest of the country. You did not want to- Sold down the people. river, that was the expression. Yeah. You did not want to go to Louisiana. Mm -hmm. People would threaten you, I will send you to Louisiana. It was notoriously a, a place no one wanted to go. And sugarcane is a really brutal, hard crop to, to work. Um, so, they, they stopped the importation for a little while, but the planters realized they needed an increased labor force in order to accumulate the wealth and, and tackle sugar production um, that, that they wanted. So they reopened the trade in late 1828. And um, from 1828 to 1831, you see the largest number of slaves brought into Louisiana uh, from the time of the Louisiana Purchase to the Civil War in those three years. Because and of course, these are all showing up in La Bella. Is right, and so the there's so, yeah, there are advertisements, um, and there are, of course, the runaway ads, and you often see that people who were first brought down from Virginia and the Carolinas, one of the first things they would do was run away. Now, I don't know if they knew where they were running or how they were going, but they, they just <laughs> did. And that was really common to see that they had just been purchased from a slave trader and ran away. And it's you'll not see realistic. Well, if, you if you think about it, the runaway is an act of desperation. Yes to get away, but it's, it's beyond that. It's an act of affirmation of their own person. Right. I'm going to take charge of my person and I'm going to flee this horrible situation. It's and all they, I'm a human being, you know. Yeah, that's really are, all they could do. There are Native American tribes not far from where you are. Like you, you go down the 
bayou out of Homa today, and the Homa Indians are descended from both Native Americans, but also French, but also runaway slaves. Right. Um, there and so there was a place for them to go, and it wasn't Canada. No. <laughs> so um, Jane Body um, of Evergreen, the, the head of Evergreen, and I, one of the things that we have talked about really looking into are the maroon colonies mm -hmm. in the area um, surrounding Lake Dizalman and, and um, in St. John the Baptist Parish. And we know of some, um, the locations, and we've been working with archeologists from um, the University of um, Florida to come in and um, to help map it and kind of, uh, so, so that's one of the things we're hoping once all this dies down to return to. But uh, there was always an active maroon presence in the area. They also could have, if they were lucky, gotten on a ship. Right. And, and that was their, their means. There was no underground railroad down here. Yeah, we actually met up with Ibrahim a couple of years ago. I guess it's like 2016. They had a okay. conference in Natchitoches, Natchitoches. on... Oh runaway slaves in Louisiana and talked about all this. It was very interesting. Because, uh, you know, you know, the old maps that show you going up to Canada, mm -hmm. that's not realistic from Louisiana. Well, the neat thing in Natchitoches, some of them got to Texas and to Mexico. Right. right. I had heard some that. escaped into Texas, yeah. 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 What, uh, do they have any living descendants, uh, these uh, maroon colonies? Because I know there were similar colonies in, was it Jamaica or somewhere down in the Caribbean maybe? But do they have any d living descendants here in this state or have y'all looked into that? We have not gotten there yet and that's a great question. One of the things that we're hoping to do is um, some oral history, take down oral history in the community in Edgard and Lucy. Um, also Lucy, which is in St. John the Baptist Parish, not far from Evergreen, was um, a place where many free people of color lived and owned land. And mm -hmm. it's a very unique place in the United States and something that I think more people would be interested in knowing about. And some of them at times might be able, willing to harbor a runaway slave because you do yeah. have a large free people of color um but they also owned slaves right, so some of them. It, was, right. it was a very right. that's the thing about lucy it's very complex and that's yeah, probably like natchitoches isn't it or sort of sort of like natchitoches yeah, it, yeah i would say it, there's some similarities and then um but the people who live there today are just all descended from the people who lived there 100 or 200 years ago it's a very right. insular population so in getting oral histories that would be really beneficial and lead us on some trails that we that can cool. pick up a paper trail. Yeah, and you know, you could videotape them and put up a YouTube channel, like kind of what we're doing with this. It's, uh, you know, because uh, in the old days, you just would interview them and put them on a book and, you know, that's right. kind of it. It's inert after that, but there are ways you can deal with this stuff. Um, so, um, well, it comes to life with what we're doing, right? I mean, you film mm -hmm. it, or even if you just record it, make an audio file of it, right. it, it it's got an immediacy that something in a book simply does not have. And it puts a face and a voice. Exactly. Exactly. It, it humanizes and, everybody. Stephen and I went to the museum at a German town up near Minden, and it was a bunch of Germans who had followed a cult leader uh to mend oh, they were lutheran place. lutheran schismatics yeah it oh. was on it was on the same latitude as jerusalem and so when jesus came back oh. uh he would come back on that latitude first but anyway of wow. course the thing eventually broke up but all the families in the area are the descendants of those germans mm -hmm. and right around los Adias, the families in that area are the descendants of the spanish outpost you know so you have very like these little, little pockets. Isolated. Yeah, yeah, it's very fast. Well, uh, Those... Toledo Bend area, Toledo Bend area is like that too. We're all up and down that Sabine River slash Toledo Bend. You see the remnants of the old Spanish culture and and the uh -huh. and 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 a uh, guest of about five or six months ago, Bruce uh, Kraft pointed out the red bone culture too. And yeah, a lot of them, their children, a lot of their children intermarried. Um, yeah. you, know, you, get, you know, you get the descendants of those various cultures living up and down the Sabine River on both sides of the river. I mean, Zawali tamales, man, they're famous. You know, they've been eating those probably for 300 years. It's, um, 
you know, Louisiana has these old populations that have a real reservoir for investigators. Entrenched and insular. People yeah. don't leave and people mm -hmm. don't come. Mm -hmm. So you have these generations that are interconnected. And that's one of the things on the River Road that um, in St. James Parish and St. John, where I've done my work, they're, they're all aware that they're interrelated across the color line, whether they acknowledge it or not. Many of them do now, mm -hmm. but I mean, you sit down in church with them and they look like each other. And so that just goes to show you what, what I love about history is we're all interconnected. Our right. stories are all a shared story and we need to tell those. And, you know, there are really ugly parts of it, but we need to know those too. And it's important. So for your there was a there was a, a craze in the nineteenth up through really the mid twentieth century. So say for about fifty to seventy five years of so called lost race fiction, Louisiana mm -hmm. has literal lost races. Albeit they a lot of them they again they preserve their stories or their their ways of life or whatever through oral oral narratives. You know, through their food ways, through their right. dance, also through their costumes, like the, the old Islanios used to do. That's uh, true. So, you know, there's, there's all that going on. These were lost races right there in plain view. Right. So your first year, you found a lot of sales for slaves, and you found a lot of uh, notices for runaway slaves. Uh, yeah. What else was in that paper that first year? What were they? Did they do recipes? No, not at that time, but That's one of the really fun things um, that is still so relevant today are the balls, the masked balls, oh, yeah. and regulating them, and who could go, and um, the city council talking about outsiders attending, well, who were the outsiders attending, and can you go masked, and do we need to get your name ahead of time, and then things that are obviously the the origins, the very early origins of Mardi Gras, before any of this kind of, um, you know, parades and, and the right. stuff we did you, had ball, you had masquerades before you had parades. Right. And that brings us to an area of controversy. Um, are you familiar with Carl Bernard? The name's the, from... The, no. uh, the Duke, or the Prince, he was later a Prince. Um, he was part of the anti-Napoleonic forces, uh, fought at Waterloo, he visited New Orleans. Right. And he wrote about going to a ball. Uh, they had been to a proper ball with, you know, the Creoles, the white Creoles, you know, the women, and, they, and the men took him to a ball that had uh, people of color. And, and he's part of the origin of the myth of the quadroon ball. So what do you find in the records because I don't know how many people have looked in the French. And okay, what's going on there? This is, a, it's a very controversial topic and people have very passionate feelings about it. Um, particularly my friends of color who are Creole and I, I really admire their work and their opinions. But um, in the newspaper, they do make references to race and to not wanting a certain, like, to, to keeping out the women of color or to limiting who can attend the balls with the women of color or making sure only white women are attending certain balls. So there are, there are references to that. Some of it's pretty discreet and you have to kind of read between the lines, but it's there. And I think that there's a lot more room for further research into that. So, um, yeah, at some point it becomes part of what we now call sex tourism. You know, people yes. read about it in the paper or read about it in these accounts. I mean, they want to go to New Orleans. They want to go to a quadrant ball. I think it was sensationalized in many ways. I don't think it was as organized as people made it out to be. Mm -hmm. And I think it was more prevalent in the earlier days than in the later, if that makes sense. Right. Um, also, in terms of plassage, I have never seen any kind of, I mean, I've been in the archives for almost 20 years. I've never seen any kind of agreement drawn up between anyone. So all of that is highly mythologized um, and romanticized. And I think okay. also comes from like the George Washington Cable, Grace King kind of era of I just color, right? Um, 
uh, stories that they've turned out. Right. So uh, talk about race and how they talk about race because it's different than the Anglos talk about it. Right. So um, here in Louisiana, it wasn't just black and white. There were degrees and there were classifications stemming back to Spanish law. Um, and so you had negra, Negroes, who were all African. Then you had mulatto or mulatresses who were half European, half um, African. You could have someone who was called a griff who may have had Native American blood. Now, later on, when you say that, it changes with time. That could also mean someone who was a mulatto who had children with someone who was fully black. Then, of course, the very light skin, the quadroons, who are only a quarter African, and the octoroons, who are one eighth African. And um, these classifications were, I mean, they were very real to the people who were living in that time. Um, and the slave, the slave owners themselves, they, they really never said the word slave when they talked about the people. They, they called them their Negroes, their, their Negroes. Um, so it was an interesting kind of euphemistic dynamic going on. But um, you would have seen some very light skinned people. I think we all would have been surprised by what we would have seen back then. And it would not look how we might have imagined it. Um, and the infamous case, Salome Mueller, or Sally Miller, who um, yeah. the German community spotted this white woman who was a slave and said, oh, this, this little girl, nobody knew you for sure, but they were able to take them to court and apparently the, the documents were weak enough that she was free, but not her children, uh, in, in the lawsuit. There are some pretty incredible instances of that. Um, Judith Keller Schaefer and Slavery and the Civil Law, her book, and then um, a later book about um, slaves that were manumitted. She, she does some really great work with that. And some of it was so convoluted. And you will find examples of siblings fighting with each other, white siblings trying to re-enslave their black siblings. Oh my God. Um, or, you know, even pe free people of color who are trying, who are, they're on the same standing point. They're all free people of color with the same status, but trying to enslave the others. It's, it, there was a lot going on. Well, one thing, I came across a database of um, pictures the Union Army took after they got to New Orleans. Yeah. These little white children who were slaves as a right. way of, you know, publicizing to the country what slavery was about. Yeah, I was trying to get the the Northerners to say, oh, well, that looks like my baby, and it, they could be white, and, and a way of getting them to feel some degree of sympathy about slavery. It's sad mm -hmm. that they felt that it could only be done through someone who looked like a white child, but that was one of their, their one of the um, things they did, one of the par parts of the propaganda they put forth. But like at Evergreen Plantation, um, which was founded like in 1770. Uh, and so think about how long that was when which generations were enslaved. And then you also had generations of the Haydells and the Backnells who owned it intermarried, and then their slaves intermarried. And they also had interrelated liaisons with the enslaved people. So we have um, on the Evergreen slave inventory quadroons and then a quadroon who had a quadroon, which means that at that point, I don't even know if they could technically be classified as, as black uh, by the law, but they were enslaved. And the interesting thing about at Evergreen though, which you don't see um, upriver in St. James Parish, it was very elite planters who came with a lot of wealth and they, they arrived a little bit later and they came with wealth. The German coast where Evergreen is, they had to work their way up. So they started working the land and then they ac gradually accumulated slaves and gradually grew. So they had kind of a working memory of what it was like from the beginning. And they almost kind of worked with these people, the, the slaves and the free together. So they actually emancipated many of their children. 
Mm -hmm. And you will see a large population of free people of color in St. John the Baptist Parish, um, all living within the same community. Um, and we know that um, the Haydells, the Heidels, and the Becknells at Evergreen Plantation right. did emancipate their slaves. Their, who were their children? Which was a fairly common thing, especially in Louisiana, especially in the Creole Louisiana. It was, but then it wasn't, you know, um, in St. James Parish at Laura and Oak Alley and Valcor M Plantation, I've, I've done a lot of work with all of them. Laura Plantation, you will not find a single emancipation. Right. None. And there were children that they did have, but um, they did not emancipate them. And really the same with Oak Alley and, and Valcaram and all up and down that river because it was a different kind. I feel like they had a different approach to it. It was far more. It's a different philosophy, a different right. culture. I mean, really, right. I, was I was sitting here thinking culture. that earlier because yes, each one of the, each one of the plantations was, was, a, I would imagine a microculture of sorts. Yes. And it was much more elite. So up there, they had their fancy homes in New Orleans, in town, right. and then their homes out in the country. Whereas in St. John the Baptist, um, the people there primarily made their home there. They right. did not have the same, they were almost just as wealthy, but it was a different kind of class um, and a different caliber of sorts of how they approached life. This points up to why Louisiana, if you look at our history, again on into the 20th century so including you know the the, the antebellum and the postbellum periods up up until the time say of the new south that mm -hmm. this, they had such dire and, and it even does pockets of this but dire poverty where you have this tiny yeah. elite class that's pulling all the strings there at the top and most and a, and a really really small middle class and a huge underclass right and I mean, that it's, character it's, uh, it's that whole that, yeah Exactly. exactly. Well, and even part of the Delta, you know, over east of oh, Monroe, where you had yeah. some large plantations over that way, too. Yeah. I've heard that the richest zip code in the United States is in St. James Parish, and it's also the poorest zip code in the United States. Uh, the same zip code. Right. Because I, we I have would, concentrated wealth so much. Right. And that was definitely true in the 1850s and 1860s. That was absolutely the truth. Um, in St. John, even though you had some planters who were just as wealthy, um, you had more of like that, that middle class of um, artisans and, um, you know, blacksmiths and carpenters, and you had free people of color. It was a much more um, heterogeneous community than, than upriver. Where they kept all the money in one person's bank, right? Okay. Um, so I heard you talking to uh, Ed about the different ways that we have a French version of an article. We made, but, yes. But they weren't just a translation. They were actually different articles. Why don't you talk about that a little bit? So I think that the, um, and, and this is me just speculating some, having read as much as I have of this newspaper now. Um, I believe that the editors felt that there were things that appealed to their English Pop reading population that may not have appealed to the French population um, and vice versa. So they kind of um, catered their, the way they approached an event are reported on it. So for example, um, there was one report about a man being apprehended for a crime. And in the French one, it was just, oh, he was he was apprehended and taking, taken into custody. And in the English version, it was he, he was hit over the head with a brick and dragged to the jail. You know, it, and so it just, just goes to show you that they, they were a little more delicate on one side of the aisle than the other. Well, the Anglos were known for their wild ways. You know, the people that came floating down the river speaking English were a rather frontier, violent lot. Um, not known to way, so yeah, I could Yeah, particularly in that era of the cane tucks and the, it was when right. Abraham Lincoln was doing his yeah. flat boat down, journey 18, down. Th 1830s or 1840s, something like that? Yeah, late, Is that late about 18, right? Or? Mid, late 1820s and into the early 1830s, yes. How, so how aware are they of the, how aware are they of the, the French culture, say in the Cajun Triangle, 
area as well as Natchitoches. Do you know the people writing that paper? Because I've been sitting here sort of puzzling over that the whole time. You know, that's interesting. I I'm, I'm don't didn't see as much during that era. I know later on um, in times that I've, I've read the Bee, they would do ref, dis, like references, reference um, a, a paper from out in, the, in uh, like Natchitoches or... Um, yeah, because there was a paper in Natchitoches. There was a French language paper there for a short time. Right. But, uh, you know, at, at, at that, in the early eras, in the 1820s, there really weren't many papers out in the rural areas. So you, I think there was one in Baton Rouge um, and maybe in Natchitoches. But other than that, there, there really weren't newspapers as much out there until about the 1840s, 1850s, they started taking off. Um, one of our guests said, said that we well, never had, Louisiana didn't even have a printing press until one was brought from Haiti during the Revolution. So yeah. We're not known for reading and writing. Literacy wasn't up there on our goals, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we're trying. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, we're working on it. Um, yeah, the, the Picayune, the Red paper of Louisiana, there would be a weekly edition that went to all the corners of the state and would take into account news from other areas. So apparently the La Bella was not perhaps doing quite that. It would do it, I, I think later on into about the 40s and 50s it started doing that, but in the era I covered from 1827 to 1828, it was still, every, it was so new and then um, there also wasn't a lot coming in from other places. Mobile, I do think there were um, some reporting uh, reports from a, a Mobile paper. And it would be as much as like, uh, oh, the, the ship pulled into port with the Mobile paper and let me report to you what the Mobile paper said. It was that capricious in terms of the reporting. And they were also very obsessed with Europe. Um, the Creoles had this, um, need to know what was going on in Europe and this connection to Europe. I mean, many of them had business connections there. And the were still being sent, or the boys were still being sent to school. Yeah, many of them were still being sent to France to school. Like at Laura Plantation, the Lacouls um, sent their son uh, to Europe, and um, as did uh, the each generation sent their their sons uh, to uh, Bordeaux. The um, at Laura Plantation, um, one of the owners, Raymond Lacoul, uh, uh, Laura's grandfather, he came from Bordeaux, France, and maintained connections to it. Um, shipping merchant, um, and you'll see that a lot um, in many Creole. Creole um, in the case of the Baroness de Pontalvo, there was still marrying going on yeah. back and forth. You got a nice large. Bank account in America. I said, "Is aristocrats who want to make their princes?" Well, and you know, you, this is interesting that you bring this up because it really touches on a cultural difference for the Creoles from the Americans. Creoles were obsessed with air, aristocracy, right, 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 and elitism, and the feudal nature of society in Europe and wanted to recreate it here. Whereas Americans were this individualistic kind of pull yourself up by your bootstraps, do it yourself, um, no nonsense. You get a slave to do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the Creoles got their slaves to do it too, but they did it, right. you know, they were very refined and, cl and clever in the way they, they <laughs> but, but that is one of, you know, when this, this great debate about what it means to be Creole, which I really don't understand why there's a debate because we can simplify and break this down, but it, it was cultural, it was not about race, and it was about a worldview in large part. Right. You're talking about about this elite, aristocratic, even if they didn't come from nobility, they were sure trying to be um, mm -hmm. here and establish that sense here. They spoke French, they were Catholic. That, yes, yes. And they Those were are the born in it looks Louisiana. like the, 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 the Spanish culture that you get flourishing in Latin America with a lot of right. that, and also in old California, it's just, yes. I mean, which is also a Latin culture, right? Like the French culture, and exactly. it's, it's, very hierarchical. it's a very pyramidal, it's a very, very pyramidal kind of a culture, mm -hmm. and deeply we would say deeply sexist today, too. Oh, sure. Uh, but Americans, now, now here's the, the catch with that. The American culture was 
even worse because yes. because the Creoles through the civil law, women were able to inherit. They were able right. to have their own property. They brought rights with them into marriage where their property could be maintained in their own name. And that was not present with the common law um, in the English colonies and later in America. Women's property became their husband's property. And so in that way. And Louisiana had rather enlightenment Napoleonic Code, which ironically, after Napoleon got defeated, was repealed in France, but we kept it, you know, um, and it gave women more rights relatively. Than relatively. Right. Right. So, yeah, um, Pur Puritan New England wasn't known for its, you know, egalitarianism for, for, as far as women were concerned. No, I don't think you Hester know, Prynne would have, would have um, had some right, Exactly. Yeah, she's she's the embodiment. She's the embodiment of that. Well, and also the all the old, the, the so-called Salem witch trials too. Yeah. You know, where they're going mostly after women who were poor, and or landless or whatever. I mean, they, these were women on the lowest rung of the ladder. Right, and you will see that here, but it will be free women of color, right? Who are targeted, typically. What are they targeted with? Like, what are they accused? Well, the voodoo kind of stuff. Um, it was really easy to blame them. Well, they, you know, the, the attitude of, well, they're seductresses and they're, they're going after our moral upstanding husbands with their, it, it, they were painted as these, um, Femme fatale. Yes. Oh. And, and, um, they, they were kind of a scapegoat in that way. And the they were also- law by the Spanish, you know, Right. Uh, that uh, any woman of color had to wear a tignon, which is a kind of turban. Right. Uh, because if white men saw their hair, they would just become lust. Well, and they were, oh, they so beautifully took that and they, they used it, they, they had these beautiful, colorful tignons and they used it as a means of expression and in only a way that a good Creole, uh, uh, you know, lady could down here, that the they were so good at resisting. You still, still see them today. There are people that still wear them. So but that's one of the things too in, in La Bea, in the, the B, um, you'll see a lot of discussion about laws that were being made, like that seem ridiculous to us, but that were apparently important to them. Like what color the slave, the enslaved laborers working on the chain gang war okay well i want it one council member i want it to be yellow the next one well i think it should be green and it's just so absurd and, and it reminds you of some of the absurdities we argue about today of course but you know they had their rationale well if it's green you won't be able to see them when they run away into the woods and so it's just things like that that i think we don't even think about when we think of that time that really bring it to life it's when I've taught some texts from that era and I've told my students and they find some of these practices bizarre, or they find them nonsensical. And I said, well, realize you are engaging whenever we read a literary text or a historical document, you're engaging in kind of a left handed form of time travel. You're yes. going back to that era. And it's not it's not perfect in the sense that it's it's mimesis. It's an imitation of an act. Mm -hmm. But it is it is a form of it where you're seeing the representation of the way those people believed, the way they lived, et cetera, the way they talked. And it seems alien to us. There, there is a divide on a certain level where we will never recapture that era. No. And, and we and have to look at it through the lenses of those, those artifacts. Right. You, know? you cannot look at it through a 21st century lens and, and a lot because you're going to lose so much of the nuances and of what was going on there. So that was also what I kind of try to do in my work is kind of to immerse myself in that time period. And one of the best ways you can do that is through newspapers. Right. right. So... Later in the century, the Picayune is inherited by a woman. She's got a woman reporter, and they start having a women's stuff, like the recipes, but also other. Did the La Bea, probably not early, but did they ever decide, oh, there are women that could buy our paper too. Let's write stuff for them. I would imagine they did. I have to confess, I have not had dealing with that era, because my era that I specialize in is more colonial and antebellum, but um, I would imagine that they did. 
Uh, I know that the obituaries, those Creoles kept, kept putting their obituaries in La Bella long after it was, because th that was who they wanted at their funerals, you know, oh, right. the readership was the, the culture in which they, that they wanted to attend their funerals, the Creole elite. So we have like business stuff, we have government stuff, and then they had like births and deaths, I guess, weddings, did they do that? Not, kind of thing? not that early. Hmm. Um, but they, they had a lot of like estate sales. Oh, yeah. Um, one of the things that was really interesting, um, was about dueling. And oh, talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Was, was the dueling out at City Park yet or where were they doing that? Well, I, it was in the first quarter. <laughs> so they were at like, so back in the day, they had coffee houses in the French Quarter, but these were not coffee houses like Starbucks. These were, these were like bars, uh, but more, more elite, refined bars, but still like bars. So they and were putting alcohol in the coffee, I think? I, if I, I don't even know if there was coffee, no. <laughs> But but that was kind of the hangout, and the, the were and there would be a lot of um, you know affairs of honor <clears throat> that would come forth of these uh, of imbibing in these places. And one of them that was reported on um, in the years that I cover was uh, the death of a free man of color, whose last name was Laveau, of that family. Um, and he was killed by a man who was also a free man of color. And so they you go through you see the whole evolution of them reporting the incident and then like the father of the dead man writes in this this impassioned letter about how you know this loss of my son and then you get a response from the other side about why he was killed and you know this is not being reported adequately and i was there and i can tell you why so it's just like this smack talk back and forth via the newspaper um, in very ornate language. Too. I was, yeah, that's proof positive of a level, a certain level of literacy in that community. That's do right. You, do you remember the Daily Reveille at LSU? Oh, yes. So I was working on my degree 88 to 96. So it was before the internet in modern flame wars and Twitter and Facebook. But we had the Daily Reveille. And at the time, there was this culture war going on in the country, you know, Bill Bennett, and, you know, we need, I don't know, teach, if you can imagine such a thing, uh, Republicans saying we need to teach values to our young people. And, uh, oh, I remember that. that yeah. And anyway, it was in the English department, a debate that was going on, but it was fought in the Daily Reveille. So you'd had these Love professors it. and grad students just writing screed after screed, day after day, know this, know that, know this, know mm -hmm. that. It was like uh, Facebook now, but I don't, you know, and, and we would sit around the grad student, you know, the mailroom. Yes. Um, and read the Daily Reveille and see if, who had written what. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that was what you're talking about embodies what was going on in New Orleans at the time, because it was not just this, this printed document. It was this living kind of back and forth in the community, this representation oh. of New Orleans at that like time. Like a public square, almost like exactly. a public square. Yes, yes. Um, and then, Amazing. Yeah, there, so there, there were some really interesting... Um, Things there also I, I put in a lot of the evidence that shows how the free people of color owned property, and how even they the women could sue for separation of property. So there there were two avenues for them. One they they could sue for separation of property, which would allow them to keep their money even if their husband was flagrantly in debt and the debt collectors were coming after them. Right. They could also be a separation of bed and board, meaning that hmm. it was like, that was essentially a divorce, meaning right. that they, they were not sharing, the, they were not married. Like, it's a, still a Catholic a, state, so you can right, right, it was delicately phrased. But so, so I, put, I, I included when I saw evidence of that too, because it just goes to show you, those are things that we don't necessarily equate with that time. I think we come to that time with a very Victorian notion of how life was when in fact, um, things didn't get Victorian 
in New Orleans till much later on. And even then it was never all that Victorian. Well, I was about to say, I'm not sure New Orleans was ever. It worked, it worked as well as prohibition worked in, right. in New Orleans or in Louisiana, which means it didn't work. Bingo. Yeah. Well, we would pay maybe public lip service to the Victorian mores, but yeah, we're going to do our thing here in Louisiana. Right. Right. It's just too damn tropical. You know, I, I look at these pictures from 100 years ago in New Orleans. Everybody's got on black and layers and layers of it. I don't it. know how they did it. I know. How did they go out in that sun? You can just feel it. like <laughs> You're sweating, up. working up a sweat just looking at the photo. <laughs> oh, oh, definitely. I mean, there is a reason for the tropical suit, you know. Like, I wear these... Uh, uh, you wear seersucker sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I like seersucker. I wear the these uh, uh, Hawaii shirts because they don't show sweat very much. Yeah. You know, and they're very cool. <laughs> so I don't do the silk ones. I do the cotton ones. But you know, you got to figure out strategies for in you know uh, that kind of heat and humidity is just not meant for. Uh, I, I was reading Bob Dylan. He um, the Chronicles of Bob Dylan, Volume One. Mm -hmm. uh, and he came to New Orleans to do an album. And he said, I th it's a great place to record an album, or so I thought. <laughs> <laughs> get a little trouble. Just get distracted. He was way. distracted, man. You know, he just writes this love letter to the city and what's going on here. And you could tell it was hard to get himself in the studio to do anything because New Orleans, you know. Um, you mentioned, uh, to follow up on something Bruce said a couple of minutes ago about the categories of subject matter in the paper, to go back to that, so th there was some uh, mention of, of balls and this, that, and the other. What about any, I know the paper in Natchitoches printed a little bit of poetry, and it was mostly doggerel type verse. Oh, sure. Was there, any, was there any poetry or any even any short fiction or anything like yeah. that in this paper? Yeah, they would have that. Um, as well. And sometimes it was excerpts of things like that from a European newspaper. Um, oh, of course. <laughs> right, right. Because that's the height of fashion. Um, so yeah, you would, you would see that too. Um, you would see stuff for like the Catholic Church is having a lottery, which you're like, okay, what, well, what's that about? That sounds kind of interesting. And they were even balls put on for children. Of course they were. Oh wow. Yes. So for your elite children there were there were balls put on. And then there were the one of the other things that really stands out is the issues of health which we're still coping with today. Um ironically, uh this this with we have not yet another epidemic, but New Orleans was famous for epidemics in that era and there was always just horrible sickness and death and it was something that they were so accustomed to it was called the necropolis of the south more people died in louisiana i think in the 1850s than in any other state in the union so but in, in the 1820s they they didn't even know what caused any of it and they would talk about these miasmas and right 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 there, and and the, how they created um a mortuary chapel especially yeah, talk about that isn't that at the back of the quarter yes and and so it could you could go there and have the funeral and bring the dead person there and then just go immediately into the cemetery and there was no going through all of town because remember town small then town is just French Quarter and right. um, St Mary over um, the, the what's now the business district and and that then chapel is just right across Basin right. today from the cemetery so you just carry them out there and. Uh, right. them, or, or and, and the newspaper them. shows their rationale and how they came about doing this and a large part of it I mean they mention not wanting to expose people to disease but a large part of it was almost it, this emotional plea about um, people going to mass at the cathedral don't want to see this reminder of death and loss because literally every family in new orleans at that time had experienced some kind of tremendous loss and so, so if you have a special chapel like most right. mortuaries today have a chapel for their smaller services yeah. and if you associate that the only time i ever go there is for a funeral mm -hmm. and so when i go to church i'm not sad because i remember my dad or my grandmother right. up there uh in the casket, I associate that with the mortuary chapel. 
Exactly. And then they had these sulfurous baths. Hmm. And they even that had... sounds kind of good. I, they even had them for, um, for people of color. Now they, and one of the big ads was, it was really exciting because they had moved to a new building. So what they could do was you could have a separate entrance for the people of color. So you didn't have to go in with them or share any, any space with them, which is of course, you know, Jim Crow segregation, you know, a, a harbinger of, of the future with that. Right. Which seems a little contrary to the general Creole ethos, as opposed to the Anglo, which is much more rigid. And it may have been the the infiltration of the Anglo mindset. Yeah, you know? yeah. I bet it was like they were trying to trying to mimic what the Anglo's were doing. What was their attitude toward the Angloization of New Orleans and Louisiana in general? Like with these newcomers coming in and wanting things their own way. Well, so it, it's kind of this, it, this curious um, catch-22 where in that they, they welcomed them because they brought money. Mm. And strangely, the Creole planters, the slaveholders, had more in common with the elite American slaveholders than they did with, with immigrant population or other people. So in that way, they were united in working towards the preservation of, of slavery and um, accumulating wealth in these big plantations. On the other hand, there was this cultural divide where they felt that um, their rights were being encroached upon and they wanted to be continue to be dominant and language and, and religion were important parts of that. In the newspaper, in the B, you'll see there's um, one congregation, a Protestant congregation comes to the city to ask for um, a lot or for, a, to, for them to be allowed to have a place, a, a lot to put their place of worship. And one city council member actually says, well, in the Louisiana Purchase, we were told we were allowed to keep our religion and our religion was Catholic. And I don't, I don't think that adheres to, the, to what we agreed upon here. And so they wanted to deny them this right. And the other guys more reasonably, sensibly said, no, we could have our religion. We just, we couldn't impose it upon others. So it shows up there. We have, have you read the Ursuline correspondence with Thomas Jefferson? Yes. We've got the whole, as far as I know, it's the only place on the internet that it's all transcribed in a, in a JPEG so you can actually read it. Yes. But the Ursulines were worried that the Americans would come in and enforce Protestantism and, of course, confiscate, which is what Protestants do. They confiscate Catholic property. Mm -hmm. So they wrote this letter, and then it's a petition, and they all signed it. All the nuns signed it. Yes. And then Claiborne uh, writes a cover letter where he attests these are fine women. They're doing the dots work. You know, they're training young girls helping the sick and whatever else they were doing at the time and then um they're training young women in republican virtues yes yes right. which Basically. is critical if you're an enlightenment thinker like tom jefferson yeah and then you have jefferson's letter back and it's not quite the danbury uh letter but it's close you know he's saying well you know we've got basically we've got this constitution and it allows you to practice freely even as it allows the Protestants to come in and practice, but they aren't going to take your stuff, you know, property uber allis kind of in uh, uh, American pro uh, law. Uh, but it's a great, you know, kind of, I guess, when was it? 1804? So it's a little bit before your time. It's at the start. It's almost at the start of his presidency. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, and a, it's, it's, a, it's at the early days of it. It's, mm -hmm. the, it's the, you know, right after the, it's the summer, I think, after the, um, or maybe before. after the purchase. Yeah. yeah, it's right around the purchase time. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, anyway, all, all these Catholics are having to learn to get along with Protestants. That's one of the things. Um, and, and then the, the thing you think about, too, is the slave population was also having to do this. So, you had this enslaved Creole population that was Catholic and spoke French, and now this tremendous population of slaves being brought in from Virginia and North and South Carolina and Maryland, and they were Protestant and they spoke English. So, just and they're as Black Baptist men, you know, yeah, or AME yeah. or whatever, you know. The and just as you're seeing this, this, this conflict in the European community, the, the people of power, you're seeing it also in the slave quarters. 
Um, mm -hmm. and there, but, but they were far better, I think, from what I've seen at integrating and coming together for their own common good right. and working right. together. Um, which at Evergreen, if you look at our, um, our slave database, it's, we have a database of over 400 enslaved individuals who lived on Evergreen Plantation, and it'll show whether they were American or Creole slaves and trace their lives. And they intermarried and their families worked together. So. Yeah, and the Creoles and the Americans, the white had more, I mean, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with The Awakening by Kate Chopin. Oh, one of my favorites. So if you read the book, uh, Edna is not Creole. Correct. She's right. from Kentucky, I think. And she's yes. used to riding horses. And That's right. She's used to getting a tan. She's an American girl. And her husband is living on Millionaire Row on Esplanade Avenue. Yes, but he's painted his house white which is an Anglo color. And he's, he's married, trying to stand a little bit, yeah. You know, Edna's kind of a shiksa, you know, she's, um, you know, she's a representative because he wants the money of the Americans. And she's his kind of entry card to the American community. But they can't quite make it work, you know. Right. They can't quite figure out because... He wants just, to be an assimilationist, you know. Well, he wants her to assimilate and she doesn't know how or really want to, you know, like, yeah. I've got to stay here and dress up and in this fancy house dress and wait for people to call on me. I'm just going out. <laughs> no, they were very, even then they were very elitist. The Creoles were and almost more so because after the civil war, they really felt like attacked and like they had to insulate themselves and um if that makes any sense right so was well, there a lot of intermarriage with the americans or how did that there, there was um more so i think how i would say it is there's always been this notion that the creoles and americans hated each other and there was they had nothing to do with each other that's not true they worked together when it was beneficial for them to work together they certainly worked together to continue slavery um, and to amass wealth. They intermarried when they were on the same level, class right. level, shall we say. Right. But they're, so, so I think that it's been exaggerated in some capacities, this, this dif distance. There, it existed. It certainly did. And we have many, many examples of it. But it wasn't an, an, a like black or white thing. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Right. We, no, this is this uh -huh. is this is is a really a kind of an embodiment of of what Howard Zinn does in People's History of the U.S., where you see again those elites, the tiny group of elites that are pulling yes. the strings, and everybody right. else is on the bottom, or at least you know, or, or a smaller group in the middle, and then a large, large underclass. So, um, Faber's um, Land of Dreams, which came out a couple years ago, it kind of talks about that, how in New Orleans, really, it was more about being elite than it was. Mm -hmm. Was uh, that the uh, history that starts with uh, Claiborne dancing around the fire nude with the Indians? Uh, no, I don't, I don't remember that. <laughs> Stephen, which book was that? It was about... Know. Yeah, not Claiborne. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Bienville. Oh my God. Oh. Yeah, yeah it's further back. Yeah. Uh, at the end of at the end of the of the 17th or 18th century, probably. That was it. Lawrence Powell was that his? Um, Maybe. Um, I'll have to look it up. But we love Kate. I love Kate Chopin. I'm so glad you brought her up. But because she really, her stories stand today. Oh, and yeah. I think that they are very accurate portrayals of the culture of that time in a way that maybe Grace King or George Washington Cable kind of didn't, they didn't quite hit the mark at, like Kate Chopin did. And they're almost modern, her stories. And oh, Desiree, very. Desiree yeah, yeah, we, we haven't answered those questions satisfactorily today because we've still got people that are pushing some sort of assimilation. You know, when you've got people pushing an English only kind of a school curriculum or they're really policing uh if you've heard what happened out in it was in arizona where they wanted to outlaw or abolish uh i think it was hispanic studies programs in the high schools or something i right. mean again it's they want to essentially want to put a dead end sign 
at the end of the roads of, of so, so to speak of some of those right. you know particular cultures and not let those people tell their stories right and uh, the storm was not published in her lifetime i don't think it hit to print until right. the 60s or 70s right. it's just it's a real a matter woman, of controversy a woman having an affair and living happily ever after they eat shrimp for supper you know it's That's like right. Oh my God! No, it's Jason Barry, City of a Million Dreams. Oh yeah, I've heard oh. of that. Okay. And the oh. opening chapter, like Claiborne, no Claiborne, damn it, Bienville. It's a Bienville. Uh -huh. Bienville. Um, he's smoking the calumet. He's got tattoos of snakes all over his body. He's dancing on the fire naked, uh, sleeping with the Native American women, was, and demanding the heads wild. of his enemies. Yeah, it was total he, he he explicitly compares it to heart of darkness he uh, uh i can see that that's but like desiree's baby <laughs> that is my favorite short story i think it holds up to this day i think that it is so telling about american culture uh louisiana culture to this day and um jane jane body at evergreen we have uh she took a bunch of students out back to the slave quarters. We have all 22 original slave cabins in the place where they were located. So you get right. the full feel and all just that hits you when you sit down there. Is that, the, read it to them. is that the road with the trees and then the slave yeah. quarters? Yeah, there, I've seen that in movies. That's right. Um, we, we've been featured in a lot of movies, but she read that story to them out there and you really get this sense of it in a, in a new dimension of, of what it meant when you have the big white house. Off, mm -hmm, the, off the background and then you're sitting there in the, the cabins and, and, and in that community and the stark contrast and what it meant. If, um, if you've read The Marriage of Compare Le Pen, it's the follow-up to uh, the tar baby and uh -huh. he initially runs off with the lioness but he's worried she'll eat him so he ditches <laughs> her. And he, the, the very convoluted long story. They, they put an Aesop story in there. They, um, they have the, the river that takes a day to cross, which is, of course, the Mississippi River. So mm -hmm. this is a story composed in Louisiana, not brought over. It's got the characters, but right. they show the new situation. They've got the priest, and then the king rewards him by marrying him off to this rich white rabbit. And uh, she has a litter, and uh, some of the rabbits are not white. Um, <laughs> the king says, uh, "Don't worry, you, compare. Don't worry, compare." You that descending minor scale, you know. The king says, "Don't worry, compare Le Pen. Some of these uh, white rabbits have brown bunnies. You know that just happens, and mm -hmm. obviously that's a Louisiana concern, right? Oh, this sure. racial blood quantum, which can always pop up." Uh, because of all the mixed uh, race in our ancestry yeah. in the state. Uh, so yeah. And DNA it, testing is exposing more and more. Um, and people I think are very surprised. And it, it just goes back to why I do what I do, which is we're all interconnected. We need yeah. to realize it. We need to share our stories and work to heal because we're well, far as, more interconnected than we've And as different as your areas of research have been and as distinct as those different plantations are they are connected you know these oh, you keep going okay here's another one here's a connection with that and here's a connection with this and they keep running into each other they don't stay separate what was the biggest surprise you had when you were reading that first year's uh paper uh articles um you know now it's totally normal to me because i've been doing this for forever now, like almost 20 years. But then I think that the degree of um, autonomy and involvement of the free people of color and their, their presence in the paper and in society and that they were genuinely, many of them were genuinely seen as very respectable, um, good, virtuous citizens. They didn't bring the racial, uh, the racialized ideas of today that we have where, um, you know, people, certain segments of the population see only, they see black and they see white and right, right. very um, dramatically different. It, they were, the free people of color, a unique segment of the population. They were very involved in day-to-day -day life in New Orleans. People interacted with each other with regularity and in a way even though there was not it was not an equal degree of um th there was not equality but it was integrated 
The or society was much more integrated then than in, it, it could be today. Um, for all of its melodrama in clunkiness, uh, The Grandest Scenes by George Washington yeah. Cable addresses that directly because right. you have these two guys with the same name. Um, Honore, I think they're both named Honore. Is it Fusillet? Uh, what's that? Fusillet? I think so. And anyway, Which one is- one of my ancestors' names. Oh, That's why I wow. remember. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and um, you know, it turns out that the person of color, even though he's got lower social status, he has more money. Right. <laughs> and so they kind of have to, I don't, I don't remember all the in and outs, but I remember it was all about the, the fact that you have these families with kind of white wings and color, people of color um, wings. And I think the Americans, Americans found that very scandalous. Yeah. You know, they didn't like that. And part they of the didn't whole, understand it. I think it was just beyond their capacity of understanding. Like that oh, happened Bruce up there in Virginia, but they didn't acknowledge it. Part of the yeah, whole, but yeah, the Tom Jefferson family. And if you look at Bruce and I want to get at some point the debates of the Congress into the website, but, but it was about the the lead up to or the run up to the, the actual purchase in eighteen oh three. And there was a lot of fear in New England about bringing in a predominantly catholic you know overwhelmingly catholic yeah. in fact culture you know, you know apart from you know having a large population of people of color is bringing in the, all these people who are catholic into this very protestant union that said it was a secular demo, you know republican democracy right uh it was scary for those people you know you imagine being a new englander or even somebody from the upper south like maryland or virginia and being probably Episcopal, maybe Methodist or Baptist, right. maybe Presbyterian. That was the, the big Protestant groups at that time. And then you're bringing in a, a group of people who are mostly Catholic. Well, and it was exotic. Of, mm -hmm. As a devil's advocate and a Baptist uh, preacher's son, uh, ah. we do live in an era when we have a mostly Catholic Supreme Court and we keep edging toward establishing religion. So right. uh, your boss freaks us both right. out. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, maybe they had... <laughs> Yeah. I don't think we should not have Catholics. I just think, hey, maybe a few more right. points of view represented. Yeah. Uh, Many points of view help right. things. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah, part of the creation of Cajun was to separate the white Creoles of Southwest Louisiana from the Creoles of color um, who would stay right. Creole. You know, and so that's been part of that. I, you know, if you look in Wikipedia, it says, you know, 97% of Cajuns are white. That wasn't an accident. <laughs> no, there's so much damage that has been done. Right. Um, because of all of that. It, trying to it adapt. It's divided to, our culture. Yeah, trying to adapt to Anglo ideas of, about racial separation, especially in Jim Crow. But I wonder, you know, so there was some of that already in 1826 um, in New Orleans, some separation, like you can go in separate entrances to them. Right. There, there was, um, but I think that there was more interaction on a daily basis mm -hmm. between the races than might be even going on now, honestly. Um, and think about the level Yeah, because of we're resegregating. We are resegregating. And also think about the level of intimacy of having like, you know, a house servant who would dress you and right. be right there with you all day long. I mean, clearly there's not an equality there, but there is um, intimacy. Right, right. And you are interacting constantly. You're seeing each other. So in a way, maybe you, you were humanized more because you had a window mm -hmm. to each other's lives. Um, you know, it can go both ways. It's like everything you do is on a stage with people observing it. Yes. You just expect them to keep your secrets. Oh, that was huge. Right. You remember Rose for Emily? Oh, I love that story. And she's had this man dead in her bed for 40 years. Yeah. And when she dies, Toby is free, but he's her employee. Right. And he opens the door and lets him in and disappears but they don't hunt him down. They don't try to lynch him, which you would maybe expect. Why? Because they all understood the need for your domestics to be. Right. 
So, and they didn't want theirs to go talking. Right, right. So yeah. let it disappear. We won't go hunting him. He knows not to show back up. Uh, but yeah, the idea that a black man had a hand in a white man's death, but he was working for a white lady. So right. It's all on her. Yeah. So yeah, he knew all her secrets, right? Yeah, and they, they did. They all did. They knew what was going on. Yeah. So uh, are there any other parts of the paper, like things that they talked about that we haven't gotten to? Like to yeah, I think, I think we've covered. How about the theater culture? Is there anything <laughs> about that? Because I've got a book here at the house, mm -hmm. The Golden Age of New Orleans Theater, a big, was, thick thing, yeah. four or 500 pages. And it goes through the early theater, you know, the history of the early theater in New Orleans. So what, what do they say about that? It was, it was kind of just ramping up at that point. And they do mention, the, I think, the Orleans Theater and um, Davis, who owned it. But um, they, they mention it some. But as that was one of the things, as the, um, the B goes on in time, you'll see more and more of what they're reporting. It becomes the French Opera House, of course. Down <laughs> yeah, there. yeah. Um, and that was huge in Creole culture. Um, but yet there are mentions of the theater and of entertainment like that. Um, and, and then it, it grows as the years pass, it more, becomes more detailed. What other kinds of entertainment were there in 1826? Was there circus coming to town? Were there bands like... Uh, uh, well, there was, um, I mean, there was Congo Square, which they right. were allowed um there was there was some musical um and then people would have you know their own little like jane austen like right where you would go to a person's home and they would play for you that kind of thing um and, and tell uh, our folks what yeah. congo square was all about so congo square was a place now i don't i think that there were times when this was interrupted like revolts and and other times of insecurity but the slaves could go to Congo Square and dr um, drum and create music and dance. And that was on Sundays. They, they had a degree of freedom in that regard that I think a lot of the people out on the plantations didn't. So you and see at this- At the time, it was a field, right? It was the right. behind Rampart and it was just a field where they gathered. And yeah, it was not developed in any way. Right now, it's on the Strong Park, and of course, it's locked all the time. Well, yeah. <laughs> One of the ironies the irony of, the of that. Right, yeah. Um, but that, that is one aspect, too, that you see opportunities that were offered to urban Blacks, both enslaved and free people of color, that would not have been there for the people out on the plantation. Um, and access to information and to ships and to goods. And our friend, uh, the Wagner, that did the car baby, he also researched policing. Uh -huh. and after the uprising was the creation of the modern police department in New Orleans. And they had a very substantial intelligence, like they would send people in to listen and watch and get back to them if they saw anything that looked like a snitches. network of snitches yes. yeah. wow. <laughs> but really, stool, apparently, like basically uh, like stool pigeons you know apparently it wasn't just black people going to congo square what they people from yeah well, they would have they would get one of the things you would see was that anytime there was an assembly that included both black and white people or people of color, whatever range or hue and white people, they would get very upset, very concerned about that. People did not like that. The people in power uh, reacted against that. They would send in the police, there would be arrests made. Uh, and of course you contrast this, we go back to the theme of the elite. So the elite mm -hmm. have the falls, right? And, and not much is said about that and it's all very, discreet, but when p common people did that, it, it became a real problem. Um, and assembling was a big deal, and they really policed how slaves were allowed to assemble. Have you read Castellanello's New Orleans as it was? It's on my list, I haven't gotten to it. I believe that's the one, I'm having to go by memory. I have it on my bookshelf, yeah. He talks about the game of racket. Do you remember, did they ever talk about that in the paper? No, I didn't see that. It's like 
lacrosse. It was uh -huh. a Native American game. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. It was huge. They would go out on the Legion fields. You know how wide it is because they thought they were now there. You know, the game would be as wide as this thing. But anyway, they're out there playing. But there's this shack. And the young people are getting together in the shack and doing lewd, depraved things. Sure. Across the races. Yes. And so the cops raid it. And there's some very proper young ladies that have to be whisked out uh, rather than rounded up to uh, save the family embarrassment. I'm sure there was some remuneration involved with uh, saving them the embarrassment. Yes, yeah. and you'll see that with voodoo, too. Right. Okay, and how much of voodoo was real, how much of it wasn't, were these gatherings really about that, were they about something else? It's all very murky in terms of the, the reporting, and the only place you'll find that in a real way are the newspapers, yeah. because the travel accounts, okay, they're not really involved in an intimate way. They're not part of that culture, so they're not going to see it. So they're going to report it in a sensationalized kind of way. The people oh, yeah. who are actually doing it are not writing it down. Mm -hmm. So the only reporting you'll really find of incidents like that is in the newspapers. And this is really lurid journalism meant to be on the front page and sell papers because he's collected all these articles. Sensationalism. Yeah. This, yes. That reminds me of the, of the stuff, not the early days of rock and roll, but after the culture begins to become somewhat integrated in the South and you start getting black and white teens oh. going to these concerts and the city fathers of these communities, so to speak, are just coming unglued, you know, mm -hmm. that how dare they, you know, intermingle and this kind of thing when that's the natural order of things. But these, you know, again, the elites were freaking out about it. Right. And, and there's always the irony, the contrast of the fact that like at the very elite Creole white balls, who were their entertainers? Who were who was playing for them? Right? It was it was black men or free people mm -hmm. who were, were enslaved. So that was okay. It just wasn't okay the other way around. You know? right, right. Well, and you know the whole idea behind the quadrant ball is that white men can be with women of whatever race, but you are not going to you know, in a world right. where black men are with white women. Then you've got to send in the cops right away. Right. Yeah. And, you know, quadrant that's the ball, myth of the angel of a hearth, isn't it, Bruce? Yeah, and she just um, might not be so angelic, right? Right. But I mean, that's the Victorian image. And, you right. know, by the way, as a sidebar here, uh, our, our Louisiana or, our, 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 you know, erstwhile Louisiana, and I suppose Solomon Northrop, who was kidnapped into, yes. uh, into slavery, was a musician. He was a fiddler. Yes. And it was quite a good one and quite a popular one in New York as a young man. That's right. And he would make extra money around the, you know, they would rent him out to go play music. Um, yeah, and he would, well, and even before he was captured, he was, you know, he was a kidnap victim, basically, because yeah, all of those people were kidnapped. Oh, yeah, sure. yeah, and, and he, but he was a, he was what they called a, a caller. He would do, he would play some of the music, but he would also call dances. He would set right. the rhythms, and he would also project this, this spirit of, of, you know, goodwill and fun and excitement and so forth as the caller, you see. One well, of the slaves who ran away from Laura, if you look in um, an advertisement, one of the, the runaway slave ads, he, he ran away with his fiddle. Oh, my, yeah. Oh, wow. I just thought, wow, that just says so much. Watch yeah. out on Royal Street. He's probably out there playing. That's right. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on our podcast. And tell our folks again what the name of the book is and where they can get it. Thank you so much for having me. Um, the name of the book is The New Orleans Bee, B-E-E, -E, like the, the insect, and it's available on Amazon.com and Kindle. And then um, you can also read some of my work on evergreenplantation.org. Um, I, I had some saved up articles that I've been putting out through the blog there. Um, and then my, my forthcoming work is called Antoine of Oak Alley, and it'll be published next year with Pelican Publishing. It's all about the enslaved gardener of Oak Alley, who was the first person to graft the pecan tree, allowing for this whole industry to develop. Wow, really? Yes. Oh, wow. A real pioneer. He was. He was a horticultural genius, and yet he was enslaved. So wow. it's kind of an examination wow. of his life, but also of the community in which he was raised. That I'm whole. Going to show our listeners 
Here. We'll have to bring you back on when that when you get that when that book is. Released. I would love that. Yes, I have a lot of. Uh, I love the con. So this is the New Orleans City, um, and I guess the, the part in the middle there is an excerpt from the paper itself. Well, that um, was actually found. I found that in um, a New Orleans City directory because uh, I just loved it. I thought it looked so so pretty and really encapsulated what the the bee was stood for. For our listeners who aren't 150 years old, a city directory was a phone book without phone numbers. It's exactly <laughs> like a phone book. Although our kids today don't know what a phone book looks like. Uh, yes. <laughs> you just have to find one on archive.org. It's become an artifact. Oh my goodness. Future art of future historians searching through the archives for phone books. It's phone books I keep reading about. Well, thank you so much, Katie. And uh, thank we really you appreciate it. Doing and keep doing it. It's really valuable uh, well, stuff. I enjoy listening to y'all and thank you for all that you do. I appreciate it. Have you heard it. a podcast before? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I was listening with um, Joan Dejan about the, um, the cat, well, not the cat. Good girls, the, the the others, um, Marie Beron and, and all of that found it great. Oh, the um, the women that were sent over in chains right. to be right. That was a great talk. And it uh, was. that was a place they didn't teach us about in eighth grade. I mean, I think they didn't teach us yeah. about an eighth grade uh, Louisiana history. It was all casket girls and right. their nuns and the light shining from above. And <laughs> <laughs> Best history is what they didn't teach us in Louisiana history. That's yeah. why we have to do this work. That's right. That's why we've got to digging deeper. Well, right. you take care, Shannon. Stay well. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'll have a good one. You too. Yeah, you too. Bye. Bye-bye.